Morning, everyone. I'm just waiting a few minutes. There seem to be a few people coming late from a prior class. Um, so just a quick uh, recap then of the class on Monday. We were looking at ethics and um, we're not going to go into any more case studies today. Um, but what I, I did want to just wrap up is um, that on the course website there are 11 case studies for you to work through and to practice with. And on um, the website as well is written the approach that we followed with the sorts of questions that you would be asking. Um, questions along the lines of, of figuring out which sections of the code of ethics apply. Um, particularly important is, is looking at your alternatives as a way to proceed without necessarily having a win-lose situation occurring. It's not always that you have to um, sacrifice your professional integrity or sacrifice your level of ethics in order to do something for your employer. Um, that's a very much a win-lose situation. There are alternative ways of approaching these and if you can brainstorm ideas that will lead to a situation where you can apply a technical solution. So use your engineering knowledge, use your engineering skills to come up with a technical solution to, um, to solve the issue. That is often the most desirable outcome. If that's not possible, looking at working with your colleagues or with your boss, um, whoever is putting the pressure on you, to convince them and show them that there is a code of ethics and working through with that and collaboratively solving the problem jointly um, is often the next best. And then thirdly, there is the idea of a tribunal available to you from the PEO where these sorts of concerns um, can be reported. So this is the situation where you've exhausted all potential avenues, but you know that there is a significant risk to the public and the safety of the public involved if things proceed as they are. Okay? So it's not an anonymous, um, it's not like you, you're leaking the information. right? If you're going to the tribunal, you have to be prepared to state, here I am. I'm Kevin Dunn, I'm a professional engineer, this is what I've observed, I've tried everything technical or working with the people to try and fix the problem, but here's the facts. And then they will investigate it further and they have a process to deal with. But it's not just that you're going and sort of like anonymously typing on a website that you have this information. Okay, it is very much you're putting your name to it, your reputation is there involved with that. Okay, so that's your sort of last resort that you have available to you. So take a look at those, uh, those problems on the course website and try to work through some of them. Um, there's also, I've also posted to the course website an, uh, old exams and practice questions. So there's plenty of material for you to work through um, on that. Okay, so, um, so talking about exams and wrapping up this course, I've, I've got a set of slides prepared uh, which I'll post to the course website. They're not needed for you to, um, to follow with, so I didn't pre-post them. The uh, first, first piece of information to work through is, of course, to thank the TAs. Uh, Mirto, Hira, and Tyler have done a phenomenal job behind the scenes. You may not uh, be aware of all the work that they do to keep this course flowing, but I would not have been able to have such an effective course working um, without their help. So, so they go above and beyond any other TAs I've, I've had in the past behind the scenes. So it's one to thank them publicly that way. Um, I do also want to emphasize that course evaluations are available for you to fill out. Um, a number of the suggestions from the course evaluations do get implemented. It's, this is not just a paperwork thing. Um, you may not be aware of it, but these course evaluations are taken extremely seriously um, especially by the new dean, more than I've ever seen before. Um, so they're, they're heavily used internally. Um, some examples of improvements I've made from the course are a number of things. For example, the weight for the midterm has been increased. Uh, people felt that prior the midterm was a lot of work for very little weight, so that was bumped up. The peer evaluation was suggested from a prior class. Um, this wireless mic that I wear just to improve the sound quality and the video recordings. Having the SDL project be the same for the whole class. In prior years, that was, um, there was a bit of a mix of projects available and that led to some 
problems in class time when obviously I'm giving an example and only some of the class appreciates it. So this way, um, everyone gets to be on the same um, project. Other things that have improved significantly, this is the first year where uh, the tutorials use heavy questions from the project themselves. So you're getting a chance to get a two for one benefit. You get credit in the assignment and a credit for it in the project. Um, there was a suggestion to flip safety and operability around and I actually like that. I think I'll stick with that in future. The, f the flow is, 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 a, is a little easier that way. Um, there was a suggestion in the previous year, why not have a troubleshooting case study before and after you learn about troubleshooting so you can get to see it in two different angles. And so this, you guys are the first year to try that out. Um, so you did a troubleshooting tutorial before looking at troubleshooting and then you looked at it afterwards. Um, actually even two years ago, they only did troubleshooting once. Uh, and then the suggestion was we'd like to try this more time. So last year they did it twice, but um, this year you did a sort of before and after. The group meetings that I had with all the groups uh, were a lot more focused this year than in prior years. And uh, the requests for good quality guest speakers, Dr. Marlin, uh, Leo from Praxair, for example, this year um, was also from prior. So we do take this seriously and we do use this to improve the course. So let's just uh, reflect back a bit on our significant progress we've made, right? I think more than any other course um, that you might have taken, this one has covered a lot of ground and you've learned a lot if you've been fully participating. Um, so way back when you started in second year, third year, fourth year, you were looking at thermodynamics, heat transfer, reactor design, process control. That's sort of what this guy is in the middle. There's a bit of heat transfer in there, there's reactor design, there's fluid flow in there, but it's all just very, very abstract looking at it from uh, one unit's perspective. What this course goes and does is it brings all the other elements around that unit and we focus on that instead. So we're not interested in the design of the reactor and how many tubes are in there for heat transfer and how fast that impeller is turning and what the reaction kinetics are. Those are um, skills that you've learned already. But what this course does is it looks at these other four aspects. So we started off with economics. All of this stuff costs money to build and you learned how it scales, right? So heat transfer scales with area and tanks cost scale with volume. That may, might, might not have been something you had realized earlier in reactor design um, or fluid flow, but now, now you've got a better understanding of it and you can see these correlations in that light. You looked at the idea of payback time, right? Is it actually worth going to a bigger tank or is it worth increasing your heat transfer coefficient, you've got a mechanism now using NPVs to calculate the value of those physical changes you wish to implement. If you wish to change the control loop inside that reactor, will that expensive control hardware buy you the necessary money or revenue? Will it cover it? Right? So you're going to get improved control. Will that improved control lead to improved quality and will that quality pay back the investment of that control system. So you've got all the tools now set up to do those sorts of investigations and there's arbitrary number of economic investigations. Everything comes down to economics. Right? You can recast any problem you're solving other than safety problems generally as an economics problem and solve it from that perspective. So that's given you a new tool for your personal life. Uh, remember right back in the first week of the course back to personal economics as well as for your professional engineering life. Then we moved on to operability, the next section. And operability looks at how you can control that reactor, move it around, right? So it's no good having a car with no steering wheel and no gas pedal, right? That car you just will move and will drive, but it's not controllable, it's not operable. So we add manipulated variables to our process. We add valves. We add sensors, we add control loops, we pair them up. How do we pair them up? What is the operating window around that, that unit? So how big? What's space? So remember operating window is all about a region. How big is that region that you can move through in your process? So it's, it's no good and it's never the case that that reactor will operate at one single value. Right? Steady state actually doesn't exist in many processes. So we don't operate at one single value. We move in the space 
and the operating window gives us an idea of that. Um, units in here are not reliable. That impeller might break. Um, there might be elements that related to pumping and moving the fluid around there that are more or less reliable than others. And so we learned about that in operability. And that also leads into safety. Safety, um, we looked at the six layers. I'll show you the slide again of the six layers. But the process control systems around there, the SIS, the alarms, the relief and containment and emergency response, all um, are important aspects as well as critically the hazard and operability study. You'll often see these two play into each other, right? So it's not that operability comes before safety. These arrows might, might make you think that. Um, you could well look at the safety before you look at the operability. But very often we see that changes you make in a process to make it more operable lead it to be safer as well. So it's a, it's a great benefit. Hazard and operability studies, on the other hand, remember the OP in HAZOP, hazard and operability studies, is not just for hazards, it's also for operability. You wouldn't go through a hazard and just look at all the catastrophes that could happen. When you do a HAZOP, you also look at how you can make the process operate easier, how you can start it up easier, how you can shut it down. Um, move it from one operating point in the operating window to another operating point. Right? So all of that takes place interchangeably. And then the last major section we looked at was troubleshooting, where you're really bringing all your skills around this unit together to try and figure out problems. Right? So there's, all, there's a procedure to follow, and I'll, I'll talk about that again in a minute. So, what I'm hoping you see from this course is that there's a whole lot more to our equipment than what you might have thought back in second year, third year, and maybe a fourth year if you're in a five-year program. So you've learned, you've learned about complexity, the economics, the operability, the safe operation of that unit, and how you would troubleshoot it. All of these come together. And this diagram shows you for one unit, but it's really not that. I mean, it's important to be able to focus on one unit from a, um, a management perspective that you can manage the complexity on one unit, but then recognize that these units are connected to each other as well. And so safety, particularly safety, propagates through multiple units. Operability propagates through multiple units. And the economics is, of course, global across all units. So that skill of learning to extend what you've learned here in this course to integrated units is something that you're going to be challenged with in your career. We don't explicitly show um, and give examples of that integration all the time. We've certainly seen examples of it, so flash drums and heat exchangers combined, right? But we, we take a, a small, small bite-sized view. In your career, you're going to be looking at hundreds of these units potentially on one flow sheet, right? Any one of you that have done a co-op term and pulled out the flow sheet for your plant, it's a monstrous sheet of paper with multiple blocks on it. And figuring out these issues in, um, is, isn't so straightforward. Okay. What I also hope that you've learned in 4N is that you're far more capable than what you might have thought. Right? So you've learned a whole lot of skills from this course that you haven't learned elsewhere. Group work, time management are two of the most basic skills that you've learned. You've also learned um, how to do self-directed learning. You've learned how to improve your writing skills. You've learned that constant exposure in assignments actually has helped you learn, right? I see this in the group sick. You've seen economics four or five times and then in the final project. The amount of work that you're going to have to do studying for the exam is a whole lot less if you've been actively involved in your group work through the semester. So you'll see that benefit pay off for yourself coming up. Um, you've also realized that you can't do all of this work yourself. That's certainly for, for sure in the project and in the assignments, and that's intentional. And some of you, this is quite normal, I see this every year, some of you realize that this just isn't for you. You're in this classroom not because you've necessarily chosen to be here. Many of you are here for whatever pressure from your family, because your friends are doing this, that's why you're doing it. It's not you're not here to do chemical engineering for some of the other people's reasons. And you might realize, you know, by the end of this, you want nothing more to do with this. And that's quite okay. It's not a bad thing. But what you do take away from this course is learning how all of these pieces integrate 
and that you can apply it in other parts of your life, right? So economics will certainly apply in any area that you work in in the future. Being able to work as a team, being able to manage your time, and being able to learn on your own is something that you've got the skills for now. So whether you do this, chemical engineering, or something else in your future, that's, um, we've still achieved our goal. So tough group work for some of you. I know there were more than a few uh, groups that had a few issues along the way. Most of you sorted it out. Um, there were a few that, that persisted to the end. Um, however, the vast majority of you did come out with a positive sentiment expressed in your final uh, peer evaluation. So that was good to see. And many of you had remarked that you'd enjoyed being, uh, taking a leadership role at some point. Uh, some of you had said you found it stressful, but again, that developed some of your own skills. So if you embrace that challenge, um, I'm glad that you enjoyed it and learned something. So let's, uh, let's take a look at this here. You've, this course has a lot of self-directed learning. We keep mentioning this idea of SDL. Um, so I'm hoping, and this isn't necessarily going to be the case, but I'm hoping that um, if you've played an active role in your group, you've learned how to find information and how to judge the quality of that information. Right? Just looking, typing up a search term in a website is the easiest part of doing self-directed learning. What you do after that is what matters. How do you scrutinize that information for its level of quality? Would you put your job on the line for that piece of information? Would you put your reputation on the line and say to someone else, to your colleague, to your manager, this is what I found, and put your reputation next to that piece of information. So being able to scrutinize the quality of that information um, is important. Being able to figure out what you can do versus what you would like to do. Right? We would all love to go into detail, um, perhaps, about figuring out maleic and hydride and phthalic and hydride and learning more about the production, learning more about how those distillation columns are operated, what's going on in that switch condenser, how is that fluidized bed reactor designed, how big should it be, how is that molten salt, working, salt loop working. Right, there's a lot of nice to have things that you might want to look at versus what you need right now to solve the goals you have to do. So being able to figure that out is an important skill. I mean, you do this all the time in university, right? You choose to go to a class or not go to a class, right? Is it something that you can afford to do? If you make a mistake with that decision, this is the perfect time to do it, right? Because the, the consequences of not doing it, of missing out on an important class is not that catastrophic. Life isn't going to end. You're not going to lose your job. No one's going to kick you out of the university. Um, but this is a point in your life where learning what you can do versus what you'd like to do is, is an essential skill. You've been doing this for four or five years now already. Um, this just extends that. Okay, so I'm hoping that you keep going with this, not just in um, that this doesn't end here, that you keep going with the sort of self-directed learning capability that you've started to develop the skill for. Um, how did that jump? Um, I'm hoping that you will attend conferences, that you'll keep yourself professionally up to date, that you will go to the courses and seminars that your company pays for. That doesn't happen too much anymore. Companies cut, have cut back on that over the past 10, 15 years. It used to be that you could go on two, three conferences a year with most companies. Now um, that would be a luxury to go on one or two. Um, Keeping up to date with journal publications and trade journals. So I'm not talking about the heavy technical journals like AICHE journal. I'm talking about things like ChemEng Progress or the Chemical Engineering Journal that give you broad-based overviews that remind you in, in review articles periodically what heat transfer is and the, the important concepts in heat transfer. Even though you might not be working in heat transfer right now, it's still worthwhile keeping up to date with these review articles. Just skim them at the very least, um, revise your knowledge, um, keep talking with the experts, keep running experiments. So this is important, you'll see this, I, I mean personally I, I emphasize this all the time in my courses, but keep running these experiments that you, if you're curious about something, go, go run an experiment if you can do it. 
Often in a company, you can do these on a small scale, or you can go make very small changes to a process and figure out cause and effect and learn from that. All right? You'll find that you'll probably be one of the only people in your company that does this. And as a result of that, you're going to be the person with the knowledge of how the process really works. And when it comes to downsizing people, you're going to be the last person to be let go. No company will let the person go who knows what's actually going on. So if you're the person that actually knows what's going on, then you're going to be very valuable. And that's a very marketable skill to have. In fact, you're encouraged to do that. In the Code of Ethics, recall, we saw that. You're encouraged to keep yourself up to date. You're encouraged to keep your colleagues up to date. So train your colleagues. So this doesn't mean go do this experiment, learn the knowledge, and keep it all for yourself. Right? This means share it. Share it. But the fact that you're sharing it, that already puts you up as a very visible resource. You're the authority in your company sharing this information. Right? If you're the person that's always showing other people how to do stuff, right, you're a valuable resource to the company. So it's not, it's not knowing how to do it and keeping it to yourself. It's sharing it and encouraging the people that work under you. You'll be managers very shortly with people reporting to you. Make sure that they're doing the same, or at least encourage them. Right? A code of ethics, we've said before, is not enforceable. There's no regulation that says you must follow the code of ethics. You must go to conferences. You must behave in an ethical manner, right? So all you can do as a manager is encourage your employees to do that and your colleagues. OK, so um, what I'd like you to, to, to think about over the next few days is a course reflection that's going to be due. I've intentionally put it after your last exam. So it's a, you've got a full day or so after your last exam on the 17th of December. Now, you can do it before. There's nothing stopping you from that. But I don't want you to be constrained by time. Um, I will post these questions to the course website. And I haven't set the reflection questions exactly yet. I haven't thought of the wording exactly. But um, they will be related to some of these questions. So what is a piece of advice you would give to someone taking this course next year that took you a while to figure out, but you'd like to let them know early on? Um, I'd like you to compare your, your experience in troubleshooting between the first and second round to hear how that went for you. I'd like you to um, tell me a bit about your participation in class. You've seen my style is to pause the lecture, ask for questions, have you discussed something. And a few of you choose to respond and interact, and, uh, and, and some of you choose not to. So I'm going to be asking you a little bit about why you might choose to respond, why you might choose not to respond. I'd like you just to give some honest thought of, of what's going on in that process. That would be good for me to know, and good for yourself to see, um, to really understand what's going on mentally, and why you might be hesitating to participate, or um, why you're very willing to participate. I'd like you to think back and learn about all the skills you've learned. Right? It's no good learning about it, but if you can actually be able to enumerate these skills and say, I've learned this, 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 and that, that's of tremendous benefit having that ability. Right? Because if you're in a job interview in a few months from now, or coming up shortly, everyone graduating from this place has got the same stuff on paper. You've all got whatever courses, and every employer is seeing everyone equally, they're only going to remember the people that stand out. And being able to market yourself as sta and standing out is a way to attract the recruiter's attention. And one way you might do that is by saying, look, in addition to learning about heat transfer, fluid flow, thermo, process control, and all these other great courses, I have also learned these number of other important skills around self-directed learning, around group work, and around time management, and be able to give evidence and examples of how you've done that. Right? So everyone puts on their resume, I can multitask. Every resume I see um, from students here, I, I write a lot of references for people. I ask them for their reference, for their resume. Everyone's resume says, I can multitask. Okay? But they, there's no evidence of that. Writing it on a piece of paper doesn't make it true. So how do you prove that you can work in a group? How do you prove that you are self-directed, have a self-directed learning ability? How do you prove that you can manage your time skills? The, the course project in this course is one way that you can demonstrate that with. And I'd like you to think back to 
that process, reflect on it because that way you've got it in your back pocket for your next job interview. Um, I'd like you to think about the surprising and important things you've learned in 4N, something that might have stood out in your mind as that's really interesting. And you may have some goals when you came into this course the very first time and you stepped into this class. You may have, uh, I'd really like to do this in 4N or I've heard that I can learn about this in 4N. Did you actually accomplish that? Um, is something to think back about. So um, you've got a few, uh, plenty of time to think about it. I'll post, um, post the reflection web link to you. It will be in an email to you and you've got um, a good 15 days or so to work on it. Okay. Any questions on that in last important piece of work? Sean? That could be like a survey thing or do we write after like a um, it's going to be a survey, so there will be structured fields that you fill in. Um, now the survey is, unfortunately, it's not like you can save it and come back to it. So you may want to um, go to the survey, copy the questions into a Word document, write them, write your answers, and then just go paste them in later on. Okay, I'm just giving you these here right now so that you've got this going around in your head while you're studying so that when it comes to the I think your last exam is on the 16th of December or the 15th, then this isn't a surprise for you, right? You've, you've had this uh, going around in your mind for a few days. Any other questions? Okay, so um, what's in the exam? Well, everything is. Everything that we've covered in the course is in the exam, from economics to operability to safety to troubleshooting this last section on ethics and professionalism, as well as all the material we cover in tutorials um, is, is in there. Um, when it comes to economics, ideas around personal finance are important, the idea of time value of money, the idea of alternative investments, ROI. Taxes and depreciation are always taken into account, and the idea of sensitivity analysis. We ended off the personal, the economic section with the idea of capital cost estimation. And you don't need to bring any of Don Woods' textbook to the class, to the exam with you. What you do need to bring, however, are the CRA classes and the CEPCI cost indices. Okay. This, uh, these sets of slides, by the way, I will post. So it, uh, you don't need to write anything down from this. Okay, so that's the economic section. We spent about four weeks on that. And then we moved on for about three, three or four weeks or so on operability. Operability, as I've mentioned before, um, is related to the operating window. Flexibility is related to the idea of being able to control the process. What are your degrees of freedom? What's manipulated? What's controlled? How is the loop pairing decided? Reliability was a topic where Dr. Marlin came and spoke for two or three classes, and he spoke about why we see all these parallel and series structures, how do we quantify reliability. Um, and then I took back over from him looking at transitions, starting up, shutting down. We looked at the idea of batch units being connected with continuous units, the idea of intermediate storage as a way to improve that transition ability. Um, and it also, by the way, improves the reliability and flexibility of a process to have that. Um, so we get multiple benefits from those storage, storage units. I just actually the other day came across an interesting way of understanding why you might have a storage vessel in between your plants. If, imagine, um, imagine you take your, your daily spending, right? So maybe on average you spend about 50 bucks a day for you take up your rent and your food expenses and whatever other expenses you have and you divide it up on a daily basis. It might be $50, $60 a day. But imagine someone gave you $60 every day and you had to spend it all that day. Well, by the end of the day, you lose it, right? So it's like money coming in, money going out. There's absolutely no flexibility with that sort of way of operating. You've got flow in, flow out. But the idea of being able to take your money and buffer it into a bank account and build up money, so save your money up, being able to purchase something that costs more than $60 and not starve, is the idea of a bank account. A bank account is nothing more than exactly that storage vessel. It's a way to grow and then shrink and grow and shrink your money when and as you need it. It's providing that necessary flexibility for you. 
Okay? So it's, it's an important concept why we see so many storage vessels in a plant for that same reason. And then Tyler looked a little bit at scheduling around batch sequencing and scheduling for us. Then process safety was, um, we looked at the hierarchy, there's these multiple levels. We really only focused on the first four. Those are in our domain of understanding and knowledge. The idea of containment and emergency response is something beyond the realm of chemical engineers. Um, but we looked intensively at control loops again, alarms, setting high and low levels, safety interlock systems and, and how they participate in the hierarchy as well as um, finally relief. So, so we're, we should be comfortable with this. We've seen this um, in your project. You had another opportunity to work through this. So this shouldn't be too hard. We looked at a good case study, BP Texas City case study, and then we also looked at hazard and operability studies in our project um, to help us identify these hazards so that we can go add basic process control systems that we might have forgotten about. In your HAZOP, you might have identified an alarm or two that you forgot about. So HAZOP plays into the safety hierarchy. The outcomes of your HAZOP are to improve this hierarchy for you. And remember, as always, uh, every layer in that hierarchy should be independent of the other. It's no good if your alarm system is on the same network that controls your control loops. Because if that network or that power supply goes down, then you lose multiple layers in this hierarchy simultaneously. The idea is to have that independence through them. The last section we, we covered, oh, sorry, second last section we covered is on troubleshooting. We looked at this idea of simply controlling our emotions, being, uh, getting into the problem, defining what is the state where we would like to end up. Um, what is fact and what is opinion, we saw uh, that come through in the explore stage as well, where you try to figure out what are the true variables at, at play here and can you corroborate the variables. So can you find an alternative sensor that gives you a corroborating evidence of that fact? Um, can you use cause and effect? All of this comes from your undergraduate courses. That whole explore stage comes from from learning those fundamentals and applying them here. And then we, we investigated a, a procedure. Now, I've said this in a prior class, you've troubleshooted successfully your whole life, right? You've, you troubleshoot the printer that's not working at home. You've troubleshooted software that's not working in your computer. You've troubleshooted a recipe maybe that isn't working quite how you'd like it to come out. Uh, we do, you've troubleshooted a car that doesn't start. All, all your life is spending working with troubleshooting, and you obviously have a way to work with that. This is just providing an alternative framework, one that in a systematic way we record our root causes, and then we try to eliminate those root causes based on evidence and based on experiments that we, we run. So it's just an alternative for you to, um, to look and try and use. The outcome from a troubleshooting exercise is obviously to fix the problem for the short term and hopefully you get to spend time and money to look at a longer term solution. And then lastly, and important, is to be able to reflect back about why that problem even occurred. Um, and, and, your, and look back isn't just about the problem that occurred but also what you did that was successful in the troubleshooting. So again, the only way you become a better troubleshooter is by looking back and say, okay, next time I'm not going to do that. that. That really wasn't a good way to spend my time. Or, you know, talking to operators and going to the control loop um, digital data was a successful and beneficial use of my time. So looking back at what worked and what didn't work as you went through that process is, is valuable. Now you've had um, at least six chances in the troubleshooting tutorials plus the one in class. Uh, there's at least, I know, of uh, one more case study in Dr. Marlin's textbook that he covers that's linked on the course website. There's two other case studies under the practice problems on the course website. Um, and so you've got, you've got a good amount of material here to try this out. And it, it, it will appear in the final exam. Okay, I haven't said it yet, but uh, there is always a troubleshooting question. Um, I've posted the last two years of final exams on the course website and you will see that troubleshooting consistently comes up in that. I will say that actually uh, 
if you're looking at 2012 and 2013's final exam, they're not particularly good. Um, not my best work. So the, this exam will be a little bit different this year. Okay, then the last section of the course was professionalism and ethics. We, uh, we looked at, an, at a case study in class. There's 11 more on the course website for you to look at. And I've posted a detailed process to follow when you're looking at that. Um, and again, you will need that code of ethics, that long um, eight subsection um, code of ethics, for, and it's posted on the course website if you don't already have a copy from class. It's two sides, yeah, yeah eight sections. It's section 77 of the Ontario Act. I, I posted that same handout as a PDF on the course website. So if you didn't uh, if, get it in class, um, you, you're able to download and print it. Okay. So the final exam, someone in the registrar's office has perversely put it on Saturday evening at 7.30. Um, that ha day happens to be my birthday. <laughs> I may or may not be there. <laughs> um, at, especially at 7.30. In fact, I, I probably know I'm not going to be there because of a prior... Um, uh, event that's happening and it's unrelated to my birthday but um, that I've committed to already so I may not be there but here's the deal it doesn't matter if I'm there or not what does matter is that um, this part in bold is the key if there's anything that's unclear like I don't need to be in the exam to help you right but if there is anything that's unclear or incomplete you may make a reasonable assumption and continue with that question. Mirto has indicated she might be able to make it to the exam. I just haven't found out if the university allows TAs to be in there. Um, so I'll see if Mirto can make it, uh, and then she might be around to, to assist you. Um, you may bring anything into the exam. You can, uh, any notes, any textbooks, I really don't mind, as long as it's in printed form, any calculator, you may write in pencil. Please make sure, though, that it's dark. Some, uh, some of you write with very light um, pencils, and that's um, OK, but it's not, not the best when it's the 90th paper that I'm grading late at night. Um, please answer the questions in any order in the booklet. Um, I would prefer, if you remember, to answer each question on a new page. That's helpful only because um, myself and the three TAs are grading this, and so it's easier to locate questions if they always begin at the top of the page. Um, those booklets cost a few cents each. You're not saving anyone any money by um, cramming all your notes into one half of it. So spread your work out. Use a second booklet if you need to, and, um, and make sure that it's, you, if, you, if you do remember to do that. Um, please also, no need for long, beautiful paragraphs. Um, I can read them. I have no problem. They take a lot longer for you to write, though. So where appropriate, please feel free to write short, concise, bullet point type answers. Um, as long as you're, you're conveying your knowledge, that's all that matters, is that you can demonstrate your knowledge to us. Okay. Again, I've mentioned this to my class in 4M, but don't repeat the question back to me. That's not a good use of your time. I, I gather that that's something you learn in high school, and it's really not needed here um, in university. The other um, important resource available to you is not just the slides on the course website, but also Dr. Marlin has written a chapter on safety, a chapter on operability, and a chapter on troubleshooting. Now, these are long chapters. They're 100 pages each on, the, on his website. But there is some valuable information in there. So at least um, if you're looking for extra case studies to work through, um, maybe something in operability or troubleshooting didn't come out, didn't come across clearly. There's an extra resource for you there. Okay. Again, as I've said before, the slides, the videos, guest lectures, all of that material that we cover in class time is examinable. Any questions on that? For now. No. Okay, the, uh, the exam is three hours. That's not up there. So it's a three hour exam. And. Then lastly, um, I appreciate all your feedback, all your comments. There's been some really good interactive discussion in class as well as after class. Um, it's been really good to teach this, this year 4N. I've really, really enjoyed it. Um, I will be seeing most of you again, I think, 
if you choose either of these electives, 4C and 4G, um, this year you're seeing me four times if you choose it far too much. Um, so I, I don't mind though, I enjoy all these, all these four courses, they're great to teach. Um, so thank you very much and good luck in 4W. Okay, thank you.